This is the Art of Dental Finance and Management podcast brought to you by Art Wiederman, CPA with Ide Bailey. Whether it's taxes and investing or planning wisely, Art is the expert to make your dental practice profitable. At Ide Bailey, what inspires you inspires us. We provide a suite of accounting and advisory services dedicated to the total care of your practice. Visit our website to access our tools and resources tailored for dentists, idebailey.com slash dentist. That's E-I-D-E-B-A-I-L-L-Y dot com slash dentist. This podcast is distributed with the understanding that Art Wiederman, CPA, and I Bailey LLP are not rendering legal, accounting, or other professional advice. Listeners should consult with their business advisors before acting on any of the information or opinions shared. If you have questions and or feedback, make sure to email Art over at awiederman at idebailey.com. That's A-W-I-E-D-E-R-M-A-N at E-I-D-E-B-A-I-L-L-Y dot com. You can also give Art a call at 657-279-3243. Without further delay, here's your host, Dental CPA, Art Wiederman. And hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Art of Dental Finance and Management with Art Wiederman, CPA. I'm Art Wiederman. Welcome to my podcast. I am a dental director at the CPA firm of Ide Bailey, and I'm located in Southern California in the city of Tustin. And today we've got a really interesting and uh, pertinent topic, timely topic, as a matter of fact. Um, We work with a lot of doctors who are entrepreneurial, and they are looking at um, growing their empire, expanding their base, uh, and owning multiple practices. And my guest today, uh, DeWalker Sinha of Tusk Partners out of Charlotte, North Carolina, is uh, one of the nation's experts in how to help doctors do that. And we're going to talk about, you know, what do you have to do? What do you want to do if you want to start owning your first, second, third, fifth, tenth, fiftieth practice? How do you grow your empire? Uh, what's the exit strategy? How do you get financed? And how do you manage it? Because that's the biggest uh, challenge that I see in multiple group practices is doctors, they, they want to they wanna own a lot of practices. They see opportunity, but, but they just don't know how to build the infrastructure to make it work. So we're going to talk about that with uh, DeWalker today. He's, uh, I've, I've known uh, DeWalker for years um, when he was in banking, and, and he's one of the smartest guys I know, which is uh, a prerequisite to being on my podcast, to being a really smart guy. So we'll get to him in a moment. Um, I want to give you a little information. First of all, uh, talk about our wonderful partners, Decisions in Dentistry Magazine. Uh, they just support us every single week, and they have great clinical content, and uh, their CE courses are, are unbelievable. 140 courses you have available to you at one one very reasonable price. Uh, courses like Role of Maternal Oral Health on Fetal Development, Healing Progression of the Free Gingival Graft, and um, Optimal Panorex Imaging. These are the types of courses you get very, very reasonably priced. Go to their website, www.decisionsanddentistry.com. And if you do that, uh, you'll click on the podcast link also, and you can get a complimentary consultation with a member of the Academy of Dental CPAs, of which I am a proud member, 24 CPA firms across the United States that represent over nine I keep saying 9,000. We're up over 10,000 dentists now. We're in the five figures, folks, big numbers. Um, And this is the time that you need a dental-specific CPA, www.adcpa.org. And I have a great, uh, exciting announcement. I've been telling you guys for weeks that I have a special podcast coming. Uh, Not that uh, talking to DeWalker is not special. It's going to be very special and very informative, but my 100th podcast is coming up on November. It's going to be published on November 11th. And I've been telling you, I've got a special guest. I've got a special guest. I didn't want to jinx it. Well, we finally recorded that podcast uh, yesterday. And um, my guest for my 100th episode on November 11th is Dr. Kathleen O'Loughlin, who's the executive director of the American Dental Association. And what a wonderful lady. Uh, what a great conversation we had. I learned I learned a lot about ADA that I didn't know when I was listening to her. And, you know, we, we're going to talk about her challenges uh, and the ADA's challenges, uh, not just starting on March 16th, but all the way back to January. I mean, the story she's going to tell is very fascinating. So put it on your calendar. Uh, it's going to come out on Wednesday, November the 11th. 
Uh, one more thing is if you guys are interested in saving taxes, research and development tax credits are becoming more prevalent for dentists all over the country. And we've got you covered at Ide Bailey. So go on to our website, www.idebailey, that's E-I-D-E-B-A-I-L-L-Y.com. Go to the um, uh, go to the link. It's www.idebailey.com forward slash dental R-D. You'll be able to read some articles about the research and development tax credit. You can go back and amend three years. And you can fill out a quick 10-minute application, not an application, and basically information about your practice. And one of our folks from our R&D group will give you a call and see if we can save you some money. One of my long-term clients, I understand uh, just a couple of days ago, they told me he's going to be able to get about $44,000 in credits. So that's all really, really good. So let's get to our guest today. Uh, again, I've known uh, DeWalker Sinha. Uh, from his days at East West Bank, and he's a really, really smart guy. He's with a company called Tusk Partners out of Charlotte, North Carolina. And, you know, Tusk is one of the leading dental merger and acquisition firms in the country. They work with entrepreneurs. Um, I see their names in, in deals and working with groups and, and, and all this stuff. And, and, and one of the great things about working with a company like Tusk is that uh, it's just so complex to build a group and to own multiple businesses, multiple locations. Uh, I have conversations with doctors all the time about this. It's like, you know, well, uh, okay, so I want to buy 50 practices this year. Okay. Do you know what you're getting yourself into? So we're going to talk about that. So dear, dear Walker Sinha, welcome to the Art of Dental Finance and Management. Art, uh, thank you for having us and I uh, look forward to the podcast today. Appreciate it too. Now, I I, I was uh, watching your video on uh, the Tusk website, and I understand you are an avid cycler. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. Yeah. Uh, well, avid, uh, I do about forty to eighty miles a week. Uh, that's as avid as I get. Uh, well, that, my partner that, Aaron actually does a lot more than me. That, that's pretty avid. I'm a Peloton guy. I love my Peloton, and uh, as long as they keep putting up uh, classic rock and uh, good stuff from the '80s, because I'm an old guy. Uh, I'll be very happy, but uh, it's it's great, great workout and great exercise, and we we need that during this time, right? It is. It, Peloton's a great machine. I have that too. In the winter months, I get on a Peloton, and you know, it's uh, focus on the wattage, focus on your for for yourself, and that's a great workout. Yeah, but you 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 probably uh, push it a lot harder than I do, but that's the way it goes. It's all we all it's all good. So. So let's get started. Tell us a little bit about your journey. I know, again, you and I met when you were at East West Bank doing lending for dentists, but uh, tell us about your journey and how you got involved with Tusk and, and some of your experience. Sure. Uh, again, thanks for having us, Art, and hopefully your listeners and will get a lot of good content about the group practice space. Uh, so, you know, we've known each other from the banking days. I was in uh, solo private practice financing early in my career, uh, which is now known as Bank of America Practice Solutions. Uh, last five years of my career was with East West Bank. I was in group practice lending, uh, dental practices anywhere from three locations, about three to four million in revenue, all the way to 50 to $100 million in revenue as far as uh, you know, doctor-owned groups. Uh, they were all doctor-owned. They were not equity-backed. We had a different group that was doing equity-backed deals. Um, so when, when we were at East West, you know, we started hosting a multi-practice summit uh, that you may have heard of in banking and I was on the banking side. Yes. And what we did was we created this this uh, this seminar series uh, from a banking banker's perspective of how to educate our you know, potential clients or current clients in the banking side on how to build a group practice. And what we found out is that really wasn't there's a lot of seminars out there, but there wasn't a granular level of content and guidance for group practices. So as uh, I was looking at my career after East West, you know, we looked at the, 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 the demand in the space and what we found out was uh, there's an amazing amount of talent in the private practice transactional services space. People doing a really good job representing the private practices. Um, then you had the, uh, the bigger investment banks that were looking at transaction sizes of $100 million or greater. Um, but there really was a vacuum on the M&A space between you know, what I would say at that point in 2016, 17, when you know, we started our company in uh, December of 16, um, you know, when I was getting along with the, you know, Karen Desports, who's one of my partners, uh, and then Kevin Cumbus, who's one of my partners, you know, we looked at, you know, different industries, you know, so where can we uh, impact the market the, uh, the, the most and where can we provide the biggest value 
to people that are going to engage our services. And this $3 million in transactional services and $100 million in transactional services was one of them. And Kevin Cumbus, who is a, a, has a, a, um, a substantial M&A investment banking background, you know, we felt and he felt comfortable that that's a market that we could educate, provide the most amount of value and, and structure those deals correctly. So we kind of entered that space in the M&A side. And then in addition to that, as we're you know, sitting around a cup of coffee, we said, OK, well, you know, how do we get those guys that are at three million dollars or two million dollars in revenue or enterprise value to ten million dollars? you know, get them to that position. And who does that in the marketplace today? And then we surveyed the marketplace at that point in 17. We really didn't find uh, somebody that was able to take and provide good C-level executive coaching um, to drive group practices from one, three, five, or to 20 locations. And again, in the consulting space, there's a lot of great operational consultants that talk about scheduling, that talk about systems, um, talk about um, you know new patient attraction things like that, but we didn't find somebody that was developing the doctor, the owner, from being a op the dentist to an operator to a CEO, and how to look at and these are these are things that you talk to clients all the time, which is a, how do you read a financial statement and then how do you translate that financial statement into operational ex- execution? So and- you know we, when we saw this vacuum in the space, you know we felt that hey you know we you know um, my experience at East West Bank and just kind of looking through what did work for a doctor, what did not work for a doctor from a banker's perspective, uh, operational spec- uh, uh, perspective in, in working in corporate America, parents' experience. Kevin Cumbus, he had worked for affordable dentures in an operational executive role um, and the investment banking role. And we said, okay, this is a market we can provide value in. And so, you know, from there, you know, came out this idea of Tusk Partners. You know, the strategic consulting and and uh, M and A firm for the group practice space. I, I mean, you've got you've got someone who is going to go from being a dentist and running one office and maybe managing five to ten people to running fifty offices and managing hundreds of people and HR and IT and and legal compliance. I mean, so we're going to talk about all that, but let, let's start. I, I want to kind of tell this story kind of one step at a time from the beginning. Okay, so you're a dentist, and you know you you see what's going on. You you see what the the the, the large national group of practices have done. I mean, uh, uh, you know, it's not a secret what their names are. You got Pacific Dental Services, Heartland, Aspen, all these big big groups that have own hundreds and hundreds of practices with hundreds of millions of revenues. And you say, hey, I want to be that guy, you know? So what's the first thing that somebody should be thinking about if they want to be a multiple practice owner? Uh, you know, first is, uh, you know, the, the journey is not easy. You know, it's, it takes a lot of commitment from financial commitment as far as uh, ability to scale back clinically. And what I mean by that is, you know, a single practitioner or a doctor that has an associate in the practice, six, eight chairs, you know, he or she may be producing a million, million five. And in order to scale the business, they really have to commit over a 12 to 24 month journey to take a step back and, um, and, and allow somebody else to do the dentistry. And, you know, that is one of the initial hurdles for a lot of doctors that are looking to transition into a group practice. Um, it, building a group practice, not an easy, again, is not an easy journey. Um, I will just kind of give you some, you know, macro level statistics that, you know, you know, one in five doctors that is looking to build a group practice and get to five practices actually makes it. You know, one in 15 actually makes it past 10 practices. Wow. So I, I, that, when that, you look at that's those... Great. Yeah, I mean, it's bad. Those, it's bad, but it's great statistics. Yeah, I mean, this is just our perspective from the banking days when we looked at people that have started the journey, uh, talking to different industry leaders, just kind of you know uh, aggregating the data, um, and then even on our perspective of of, of just uh, speaking at different events and talking to the uh, expertise there. So one in fifteen, you know, that's that's a uh, you know it, it, not to discount the other fourteen that didn't make it. It's just that people's journeys changes. So. If you're starting that journey, you know, just ask yourself the question, the why. You know, start with the end in mind. Why are you building it? And if the, the journey is to, hey, you know, I want to make $20 million because the doctor down the street made $20 million, that's probably, in my opinion, not going to be a reason that's going to sustain itself over the next three to five years. Because the journey is tough. I mean, and I give kudos to all the guys that have built three, five, 25 locations uh, because that requires a lot of self-sacrifice. Um, and, 
uh, um, and if, if somebody wants to think about, you know, growing a group, they need to kind of look at John C. Maxwell's book, uh, 21 Laws of Leadership. And uh, all those 21 Laws of Leadership are applicable if you're building your business from one location to 25, 50 locations. And that journey to build 50 locations is really a seven to 10 year journey, uh, assuming you already have three to five locations. If you have one to three location, you're probably going to be at 10 to 20 locations in five years. And that's if you have consistency, commitment, tenacity, uh, we're able to work through this COVID situation in a very responsible manner and, and be resolved toward the long-term goal of building the right team, the right culture, the right, right clinical care, uh, and the right business. And so, again, for me, the, the one question I would ask is the why. And we ask that a lot, you know, when people give us a call and say, you know, I want to build the next DSO. Um, and I think, you know, that, that, that why is very important, not for us, but more importantly for, the, for your audience. What's a good why? What, what's a good reason to want to do this? A good reason to want to do this is, you know, when I see there's a vacuum in the space, you know, I am a pediatric doctor, I'm an orthodontist, oral surgeon, endodontist, general dentist, and I believe, you know, my business model, I can provide a better quality of care for this community, provide better quality of employment for the team members at work, um, and build a, the best in class culture um, around it. And I think I can provide better services, you know, as we go into more of an on-demand service, you know, with COVID, you know, there's been spacing requirements, you know, more and more dental practices are open in the evenings. Uh, you see Walmart Health uh, entering the Walmart Dental uh, uh, enter the market. They're doing a Roshan's doing a great job as far as uh, providing uh, um, services on a macro level. Um, so what, what is going to be your difference in the market? And um, if you can, you know, say, hey, I am going to provide better services through longer hours, better team culture. I'm going to accept more insurance plans. I'm going to provide all in-house services. That means I'm going to have rotating specialists. Um, even if you are a pediatric, ortho, or oral, you're integrating with other services. And you can provide a one-stop solution for your you know, patient base, better quality of service. And, 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 and also, more important, I think people you know, uh, may not put this in the forefront, is provide the best in quality culture for team members. Um, you know, you look at Southwest Airlines, for example, oh, yeah. you know, one would say, you know, hey, they're cheaper airline and cheaper usually means worse, you know, service. You know, Southwest has really done a good job in saying we can be more cost effective, create a best in class culture and build the best, one of the best airlines in the U.S., if not the world, as far as employee retention, employee satisfaction and customer retention and customer satisfaction. So that's a good why. Uh, that, you know, and people look at their business. And, and I think, uh, DeWalker, I think that um, I always tell people, you know, provide a good service and the money will come. And and, and that that is very, very true. I want to I want to divert just for a second. So I know that individual practices, um, you know, they were shut down uh, March, April, May for eight to 12 weeks. And They've come back, and and uh, I had mentioned earlier that I interviewed uh, Dr. O'Laughlin, the executive director of the American Dental Association, and she had mentioned that uh, their statistics show that dentists are back at about uh, about seventy five to eighty five percent ish of where they were. How did the larger group practices fare in COVID? Was it different than the individual doctors? Um, so, you know, based on the statistics, I would say yes. And I, you know, we don't manage a lot of the private practice space statistics beyond it. I think ADA, by the way, I just want to give them kudos for their data reporting they did uh, throughout COVID. I think it was great for uh, the, the macro space of dentists in space, but also for service providers in the space like us, where, you know, we're trying to understand what's happening on a, on a, a macroeconomic level in, in the industry. Um, as far as group practices, uh, yes, you know, uh, most of the group practices uh, that we were engaged with were at 80, 90, 100 percent recovery um, within 60 days of operation. Um, you know, most of our groups were at 110, 120 percent of uh, uh, month to month performance of pre-COVID levels. Um, I will tell you, and I think this is uh, really good for your audience to, to kind of think through. Um, you know, uh, new patient attraction is going to be really relevant as we go into Q4. Uh, if you had a hygiene cycle that was due in March, April, May, that those patients did cancel, might not have been reactivated yet. Um, so a lot of our groups were focusing on reactivation of patients. Uh, and it really starting you know, if you get, you know, we're big on uh, uh, development art, you know, so if you think about the book, Good to Great, talks about three economic cycles. You know, I've lived through three economic cycles in my healthcare career. 
you know, and just really build a business that can sustain uh, long-term economic up and down turns. And that's building a good, healthy business. All right, Dear Walker. So if someone wanted to become a multiple practice owner, okay, are there any educational courses that they should take? Anything they should be reading? I think there's a great uh, uh, level of, of industry seminars that are out there. Um, uh, you know, just be to, on the cautious side, and there are a lot on the macro picture. They don't, I think, go through the details of running a group practice. Um, you know, I will tell you, you know, we offer a full day deep dive. Uh, that's a one on one business operator course. It's a one day course. Um, and that focuses on dissecting the individual business, uh, the leadership skill set that the doctor has at that point. Uh, uh, we do a SWOT analysis on that. And then really out of that one day, kind of give him uh, some takeaways of, okay, if you were to build a group practice, this is what's going to take from a uh, financial perspective, from an organizational perspective. And it's really customized to that operator. And uh, my, parent de- my partner, Parent Desk Force, runs that uh, uh, at Tusk. And um, I think that's a good you know, micro level course, uh, one day course that is there. And then as far as the macro level course, and you have AADGP, the American Academy of Dental Group Practices, they do a really good job. Uh, you have um, um, ADSO, they do a good job out there and other seminars uh, that are there. So uh, I think there's good content available in the market, uh, but if you're looking for macro that's there, uh, Tusk also runs seminars you know, uh, that focuses on macro level education. But if you're looking for granular data and say, give me the playbook, I'm at one practice, I'm at three practices, then I would encourage a full day deep dive. That, that That's great information. In, in a little bit, I'll let you give out your information. It'll also be on the show notes. So we, we hear the term DSO, Dental Services Organization. Um, let's talk at a very high level. Um, we, we know that there are dentists that are owners. We know that there are non-dentists that are owners. And we know that in many states, um, non-dentists are not allowed to own a dental practices. In some states, they are. So talk about, again, at kind of a high level, uh, DeWalker, how does the legal structure of a multiple practice owner set up? If you have partners, g- give us kind of a, a, a high level overview of how that would work. Uh, yeah. So let me kind of uh, separate that into a, maybe a question that people need to think about as they're building a DSO. Uh, so uh, we work with, you know, on the legal structure side, I work with several law firms to set up uh, the, the right legal structure. And, and typically the, the question one I would ask is if you're thinking about building a regulatory compliant DSO, and I use the word regulatory compliant because there's a, uh, a legal process that's very uh, uh, intensive to make sure we structure correctly. And then there's a financial reporting part that I will tell you that I think you guys do a really good job, uh, Art, that we worked uh, on several clients with you guys that the financial reporting is, is accurate. And I think that's really the, the meat and potatoes is the financial reporting after you set up the legal structure. But to take a step back, or you'll have uh, you know, two, three, five practices that will flow up to a management company. And the management company, uh, the DSO, the Dental Services Organization or the Dental Support Organization, will employ all the non-clinical team members. Um, so th- that would be legal, accounting, uh, marketing, accounts receivable, accounts payable. That'll be your front desk team. That'll be a practice managers, regional managers. Um, all those people are employed by the management company, the people that are uh, in most states, and again, there's space state-specific law. Uh, in most states, the, the dental assistants, the hygienists, and the doctors are employees of the dental practice. The patient charts live at the dental practice. All the other assets, assuming there's a, a no tax consequence, and then this is where you guys, your expertise comes in, looking at their balance sheet and any depreciation that might have been taken, you know, can we move up those assets into the DSO? And if we can, uh, in some states you can, some states you can't, that, that's where you want to hold the assets. And then structurally, as you go to expand more practices in a startup or an acquisition, you end now, you know, especially in an acquisition, you now end up having two buyers. You know, one ends up in an acquisition, the buyer of the hard assets and the non-clinical assets ends up being the DSO. And the buyer of the clinical assets ends up being the practice. And that's on, the, on, on a typical transaction. And then on a startup, you know, the leases and everything else and the equipment purchases and the supplies are all procured by the DSO. And then any new patients that come in as a result of marketing services provided by the DSO are the assets of the practice. And you really start to work uh, as more of a 
a management company and a DSO that provides the services. And uh, the, the best way for me to think about it is think about a hospital. The hospital has a management company that employs the CEO, all the non-clinical ta- staff, and they actually own the real estate, the hospital, or they might lease the real estate. But all the doctors, nurses, uh, they're all employed by a different entity that is a medical entity that owns the patient charge for the services provided for that hospital. And that's what you're seeing in the dental space on the legal side. Yeah, you talked about the legal side, and I, I'm, you know, I'm here in California, uh, and I've talked to some some attorneys who who have put deals together here in California, multiple practice owners, DSOs. Uh, the state of California and the the dental board, they're not terribly enamored with multiple group practices and non dentists owning. So, talk about, and I'm sure there's other states that feel the same way. Talk about how important it is to dot the I's and cross the T's and follow all of the legal and accounting um, compliance rules. Because if you don't, they can come down and shut you down, can't they? Uh, that's correct. Yeah. I mean, as you build a group practice, uh, I think you become a little bit bigger of a target, um, you know, from the state board's perspective. And, you know, I, I, don't, I, would, uh, I think getting the right legal guidance and legal contract is very essential um, to setting it up correctly. And then, you know, I, again, uh, I, I give kudos to you and, and Scott Aberman with your team that has, you know, really kind of invested the time to set up the right accounting process of onboarding these dental practices correctly um, and managing the management services agreement, making sure the financial reporting is in line with how the legal contracts read. So in the event of an audit from a state board, I mean, obviously you need good counsel and those attorneys can set up the contracts correctly and they'll represent you. But also you need to be able to you know, document the financial reporting and how you charge the management fee and how you substantiate the different line items on what should be at the DSO level versus what is an expense at the practice level. Uh, so accounting um, is, is I, I would say, equally, if not more, for the long-term continuity of it. Um, obviously, you want to you know, make sure your contracts are, are, are compliant with the regulatory changes every 12 to 24 months. But accounting becomes a real-time issue, especially if you have multiple partners. I think in the previous question you asked that, you know, if you have a 1% partner or a 5% partner in a bigger group, and that partner asks you and says, hey, please tell me how we're charging our management fees and the six practices that I'm managing, you have to be able to substantiate and document that. And the accounting aspect is essential to, to building a right group practice. Yeah, I mean, you, you can't, and I've seen multiple practice owners, they just basically you know, move money from the uh, professional corporations um, to the DSO intermittently with no rhyme or reason. And we tell them, we say, you know, if they call your number, they're going to look at this contract and they're going to, they're going to shut you down. So you've got to, the, the legal and accounting compliance part of this, we, we're not going to get deep into that today. I want to talk a little bit about financing. Now, you know, someone who wants to own 5, 10, 15, 20, 50 practices, you're not just going to go down to your community bank and say, all right, guy, um, you know, Joe, uh, I want you to put about 50 to $100 million aside for me over the next 5 to 10 years because I'm going to go buy these dental practices. Is that a, is that a problem? It, it doesn't quite work that way, right? Uh, no, it doesn't. Um, <laughs> I, I, think, I was being uh, facetious. <laughs> Yeah, no, it doesn't. Um, the, the community banks, um, and I think they're a great resource and your traditional conventional financing banks that you may currently be working with at one or two or three practices. Um, they've been, you know, I would say, give, you know, give them a, a handshake. You know, thank you so much for getting into the first practice or second or third practice. But if you're looking to build a, you know, 5, 10, 25, 50 location group, you need to really start, again, think about your financial reporting. That, that's where it starts. Think about your cash balance position, planning for that, and then start looking at, you know, lower middle market, um, you know, lenders uh, that are in the space. And, you know, we, we do a lot of that work. Um, and the lower middle market lenders are really looking at the, uh, how the, the operators are making the decisions, how they're acquiring practices, how they're creating equity and balance sheet. Um, I'll give you something to think about. We, you know, we are just currently working on that. And one of the calls from a bank was, today, okay, we know this client bought this practice in, in November of 2019. And the practice was sold for 1.5 million. The revenues were 2.5 million. Okay, you know what have we done with that practice in the last 12 months? Even though there's COVID, right? I mean, I mean these are questions that are happening. So yeah, the, the, I think, they, they don't uh, you understand know, the space. Uh, well, no, they do. I mean, I, I do want to say they understand and say, okay, they just want to know what happened. Oh, How okay. do we create equity? Okay. They want to. So I think what the, a lot of these banks in the middle market space are doing is they're 
they're discounting the revenue for March, April, May, and thinking, okay, then we're not going to count the expense or the revenue. Some banks are looking at it at a different perspective. So I think they are being very compassionate to what happened, but they're saying, okay, if we exclude those three, four months, how do the business operators run the practice? And I think there's substantial capital available if you are running your business correctly. Um, and I, we always tell people like, uh, you know, we do provide equity capital and sources of equity capital. That's what Kevin does. But if somebody came to us and said, hey, you know what? I want to build the next 100 location group over the next 15 years or 10 years, and I don't want to go to equity. I want to create a platform that's generational changing wealth for me and my family and really create a family fund of my own and have this as part of my estate planning for me and my family. Great. We can provide a capital source that can get you 25, 50, 100, 200 million dollars in debt. Let's worry about how we build the right business. We build the right business, capital is available. Even post COVID, even during COVID, uh, we are closing uh, a transaction or, right, you know, this next month for just about $23 million. We started that journey in April. Our client called us and said, let's get the next level of financing. I mean, think about the mindset in April. You know, we were oh shut God. down, right. you know, right. and we started this journey and we started having the conversations with the right banks, you know, around May and June. I mean, we were in this state, weren't even open till June. Um, and the banks were very receptive. They said, hey, we know this is going to happen. Tell us about the operator. And the, the, the conversations from lower middle market, middle market bankers is materially different than your commercial banker, your business banker, the banker that might have helped you finance the first one to three practices. Uh, it's more macro level, more holistic, uh, more vision oriented. Of course, the numbers have to kind of be there and make sure that those make sense. But they're much more focused on the operator and how the operator uh, decision tree process is in a stressful environment, in a day-to-day operations environment, do they have infrastructure? What does that look like? So a lot of these decisions that you and I are you know, maybe thinking on a, in a corporate side or business side, th- these guys are focused on it. And I, I do want to, you know, uh, to tell your audience members, there's a lot of capital available. We just want good operators that want that capital. And I think that's, that's where the, uh, the key thing is as you go into Q4 and Q1 of next year. All right, DeWalker, talk a little bit about what Tusk does at different stages of the process. And I want you to give out your contact information, but talk about what your company does, like from beginning to end. Yes, sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, so what we do is, you know, uh, we, we help entrepreneurs start, grow, and sell the dental practice. Um, that's you know, stated on our website. So we have three different verticals within our business. So one is the start uh, vertical, uh, which is led by my partner, Perrin Desports. Uh, and that, on the start side, you know, we have guys that have one location, three locations, 10 locations, uh, and they're coming in and, and asking us, hey, I you know, hear this term called DSO. I see my friend down the street build a DSO, or I have a DSO coming in the market, you know, and, and tell me about it and how I position myself. Uh, so the start phase is our full day deep dive where, you know, a, a business owner will come in, spend a full day with us. We get granular into their vision, the why. We do a high-level review of the operations and financials and kind of tell them what they need to be thinking about if they're building a group practice. Um, I will say we're not looking to build 100 DSO owners uh, when they come to this process. If anything, we're looking to educate them to say, this is what the journey looks like, this is what you have to think about, and this is what the other people are probably doing. Um, And I would say probably 40 to 50% of the people that go through this course We'll say, that, hey, you know what? Uh, building a group practice is not for me. Um, I appreciate the information. I know what I need to do as a private practitioner. I am well positioned now. I know uh, how I can compete with the bigger guys. The other 40 to 50% will go in and say, I want to build a 3, 5, 25, 50 location group. Please show me how. And for that, we'll engage into our consulting services, which is about 12 to 18 months. And the best way I, I think about it is, is a dental MBA program where over the 12 to 18 months, they learn how to read financial statements. We work with you guys a lot on how to get the financial reporting and educate the doctors on how to think about financial forecasting of revenue and cash expenses and uh, uh, production in a business. You know, We think about how to uh, uh, um, plan infrastructure and more importantly, how to lead a team. So you're at one practice and you might be going to the dental office every day and doing the morning huddle um, you know, you would, uh, uh, you can, it's different engagement to get people to say, hey, we got to get same day treatment. Let's make sure the patients come in. 
and all the, 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 the practice uh, day-to-day operations. When you start having 5, 10, 15 locations, you're having to run and lead people. And I always say lead, not manage, because I think people call manage, are you, how are you managing a team? And my question ends up being, how are you leading your team? Uh, and leading a team remotely, you know, being able to call them on the phone and, and coach them to success, uh, being on site, maybe go do a site visit once in a while. What does that mean to the morale of the team and to your understanding of your business on a micro level, the infrastructure? So these are all things we work on when you're building a group. How do you buy a practice correctly? How do you start up a practice correctly? The average doctor that builds a startup with million dollars in revenue the first year, agnostic of the specialty or general practice you're in. That is our bogey. $1 million first year, 15% EBITDA. That's all process. Um, okay. You know, it's not a, uh, it's not a, a, anything beyond a process, understanding your demographics and, and things like that. And then as you build this, the, the business of 5, 10, 15, 20 locations, you know, my partner, uh, Kevin Cumbus, he's on the transactional services side. So all the advice that, you know, Perrin and I gave or, or, are in real time with what we're seeing in the market with Kevin Cumbus when he's leading all these transactions of anywhere from enterprise value of three, five million dollars to an excess of 40, 50 million dollars. Um, and, and what is the market looking at? And our advice is somewhat fluid. You know, uh, six months ago, we said, okay, this is how I'm going to look at it. But now we're seeing this change in the market. Let's position for this. So it's real time advice based on how market's changing. And I would say some of our advice on the consulting side, 90% is about the same that was pre COVID. 10% is a little different post-COVID. Uh, it is a new world and a, a, a landscape we're living in. So on the uh, uh, sell side, Kevin Cumbus leads that. That process is, you know, um, is, is pretty unique because, you know, we're changing, you know, our, our business owners' lives. You know, it's generation changing wealth when you have a liquidity event of $10, $15, 50000000 million. Um, uh, and then for all the shareholders, you know, you might have a doctor that's a 2% shareholder in the DSO or a 40% shareholder of a practice. It's life changing for everybody in that journey. Oh yeah, and, and we yeah. take a lot of pride in that. So give give out your contact information. Uh, so our website is www.tusk-partners.com. Uh, 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 My direct email address is d i w a k a r at tusk-partners.com. And our company email. This goes to all three of the partners as info at tusk hyphenpartners.com and we also have a podcast where you get more granular content as far as building a group practice. So now my now my um uh my doctor's got five practices and they're doing yeah. pretty well and they want to keep practicing. Okay. Talk about management structure. I mean what what do you have to put in place and when and when do you hire a CFO? When do you hire an IT HR? What are the different components that you have to put in? So at three to five locations, you typically need to have somewhat of a regional manager. Uh, And and, and every five locations, you're probably going to have a regional manager. In about 10 locations, you probably need to hire on a director of operations. So so think about every five practices, a regional manager. Think about uh, and and every – so when you look at – you know, I talked about the book, John C. Maxwell's 21 Laws of Leadership and different leadership books you can read. You know, in a most more effective organization, a leader can manage about five to seven people at max. So if your infrastructure reporting structure is more than five to seven people reporting to an individual, it's going to create a diminishing rate of return in leadership. So as you're building that, round five is a regional manager, 10 is a director of operations, uh, typically around 50 to 75 team members. Before that, you might outsource HR after that, you're probably bringing on an HR generalist. I think some people think about bringing on an HR director. Um, I think, you know, I would be very cautious of titles when you, you know, hire people because with title becomes compensation. One could argue with title, you get different talent, and I'm not against it. But I think if you start looking at the word HR generalist versus HR director, I think you, can, you get somebody that can do 80 to 90 percent of the job uh, in most processes. Um, as far as centralizing an IT, uh, that's subjective. I mean, we see, we've seen groups at five or seven locations bring on in-house IT. Um, that's really a component of what services you have outsourced. Um, most around 10 will bring on an in-house IT person. Um, and again, when I say 10, that's typically 10. That's usually around 50 to 60 chairs. 
you know, usually that practice is about 15 million in revenue. So I want to give some metrics there to kind of think about because there's a cost structure component to it. Um, and usually as far as a CFO, I, I mean, I think this is where we work with you guys a lot to see when to bring on a, a CFO, but really it's for me to step one to be more of a controller role before a CFO role and the control role is typically around 20 to 25 million revenue. Um, and usually around three and a half, four million in EBITDA. Um, and every time you add this, and I think uh, I do want to add this one component to the answer is, I would ask your audience members to ask why. What is the rate of return you're looking for by adding that regional manager? What is the rate of return you're looking for by centralizing the HR person in-house? Do you want improvement in culture, improvement in retention, faster recruitment time? How will you measure the additional cost? And how will you add revenue by using, leveraging that person? So I think when you think about call centers, you hear those terms, people look at that and say, hey, I'm going to save cost. But how are you going to improve revenue by adding a call center? So I think each of those things of adding infrastructure has to have two questions answered, which is how are you saving and how are you growing? And if you can answer that in each of those phases, I think, and, and then be able to measure and deliver that change within a six to 12 month period, you're building a good business and you're going to get more capital in the market. Okay, so let, let's talk about, you know, the, everybody wants to talk about the exit and the valuation, and we talk about EBITDA. Um, so who, you know, I have 20 practices. I have 40 practices. You've been working with me for a year or two. We got a pretty good well-oiled machine. Um, who, who are my buyers? Is it only private equity? Are there individuals? Are there the large national chain companies, if you will? Who, who's buying these and, and, and what's the exit strategy? And then maybe just talk at a high level about valuation. Yeah, so I, I'll kind of address the valuation question first a little bit. You know, valuation um, are changing post-COVID. You know, I think, uh, um, I wouldn't say the valuation is going down. I think valuation is holding steady. I think structures are changing. So if we saw a business pre-COVID um, trade for 8x typically is still trading for 8x. What we may see, uh, 8x, I apologize, is 8 times EBITDA, uh, which is a denominator we'll kind of use in this uh, for the podcast. And uh, when we look at that EBITDA, so if a business was, let's say, two and a half, three million in EBITDA, and it would have traded for eight times EBITDA, that business would trade it for $24 million in enterprise value. Um, and that value should still hold steady. I think what's happening now is there's more of a question around recovery of those businesses, validation of those recovery of those businesses, and might be a little more in an earnout provision or a little more in a rollover equity provision. So if, you know, let's say, let's keep uh, use a $24 million number. If in the past somebody would have said, hey, we'll get you 80% um, cash at close and 20% in a rollover equity position, that would have meant, you know, you got $4.8 million in a rollover equity position and you would have got $17.2 million as cash at close. But now that number might be closer to $15 million cash at close, still a $24 million enterprise value, and a little more in rollover equity. Uh, but you know, the M&A market's still pretty strong. We're seeing valuations hold for good businesses. Um, and I think uh, uh, as people are looking at what are they building, they need to think about what kind of infrastructure they have. And that's gonna dictate if they're going the route of a strategic or going the route of an equity partner. Um, if you're at uh, uh, thinking of going strategic, sometimes strategics pay more. Now, I'll give you an example. We have a, uh, a transaction closed in a market where a bigger strategic had a void. They wanted to been, they've been looking to buy a big platform in that geography. They actually uh, uh, placed a higher LOI or letter of intent offering than a private equity buyer. Um, and that's sometimes uh, 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 impactful. So I wouldn't say that equity, private equity buyers offer a higher valuation versus strategic or vice versa. I think it's really going through a marketed process to understand, you know, who's looking for this platform, this market, and what has our client built? And more importantly, what is the client looking to do over the next five to 10 years? And that drives valuation also. If somebody said, hey, I want to be in Bahamas in six months to 12 months, that business that was trading for 24 million might trade for 20 just because the buyer has to accommodate a higher risk profile. So I think those questions just need to be thought through from, from, you know, uh, our process, from a client's perspective to understand what that valuation looks like. You use the term strategic partner. 
Uh, can you explain to our listeners what that means? Uh, yes, uh, Strategic Partner is going to be a bigger platform DSO. Um, you know, Heartland, Dental Care Alliance, you have MB2. Um, these are the bigger guys, Pacific Dental, Western Dental. Uh, so I'm just giving you some of the top uh, names that most mo- most of your audience members may have heard in different demographics. Right. Um, so those are the considered the strategics. But there's a lot of strategics that are at 15, 20 locations. You know, I would say some of tough clients that have 15, 20 locations are strategic buyers. And they will, you know, look at transactions differently than um, uh, the bigger groups, um, the private equity back groups. So you have a strategic assembly that already has a platform of centralized services, um, and they're willing to acquire a smaller group uh, from their perspective. So a 20 location group could be sold to a larger 500 location private equity backed DSO, and a 20 location group, depending on the infrastructure and the goals of the operator, might be a better uh, alignment with the private equity firm. Um, the different goals from those different perspectives as far as growth strategy and aggregation. So, De Walker, look, I'm going to switch gears uh, just a little bit. So now I want to talk to my single practice owners who may be in their 40s, 50s, 60s. Um, they're getting tired. They don't want to manage anymore. Uh, they would like to, they love seeing their patients. And they get approached by a Heartland or or one of these, uh, you know, MB2. And, 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 and so what should they be looking at? What kind of a deal? Uh, I mean, that that's happening all the time, isn't it? Uh, yes. I mean, I think that's pre-COVID and that's, uh, you know, really more relevant post-COVID. I, I think uh, just going through journey for a business owner through this uh, last six months um, uh, really helped resolve of, hey, you know, do I want the, the headaches of management uh, long term? So I think as far as what they're looking at structure, I, mean, I think comes down to understanding, uh, number one, what the valuation looks like, uh, two, how that valuation was, uh, how the buyer came to that conclusion in the valuation. Um, and, but I would not be tied there. Uh, and, you know, obviously, you know, uh, Art, you guys do a lot of tax planning, you know, and I could, and I think people look at say, well, I'm getting four times EBITDA or 80% of revenue for my practice or 60% of revenue for my practice or hundred percent of revenue for my practice. And is that a good deal? And I think that that percentage of revenue for the value of the practice is a component of that answer. Another component of the answer where you guys are really good at is a uh, uh, tax Structure, right? Alloc- asset allocation drives valuation right. a little bit. Right. Um, yeah. And I think that's where you guys, your expertise comes in a lot. So I think people need to think through that. But also, I think, you know, for that 40 to 50 year old doctor that is tired of managing, I think they need to ask the question okay, do I want to completely exit the ownership component? Because you could exit management and you may not have to exit ownership. And I think that's what people sometimes lose. In, in that is like, hey, if I if, if I must exit ownership if I want to exit management. No, I think there's a lot of business models out there that will say, you know, uh, Dr. Sinha, you know, you don't want to manage the business. We are good. We will take over all the support functions. We'll, we'll maintain the culture you've built and help improve upon that. We'll maintain the culture of clinical care philosophy and, you know, leverage your expertise to how to grow that in that practice or within that geography. But we want you to maintain ownership of 20, 40 percent. And I think that's important. Where that equity lies is important. Is it a preferred stock position, which class shares? Is it at the practice level? Is it at the sub DSO or joint venture level? Is it at the management company level, DSO level? These are all things that can have significant economic impact for, uh, for, for your audience members. And those are things that you know we work through to help structure because and that's important, especially if you do want to maintain ownership, just don't want to run the practice. Yeah, no, that that that's great. And the other thing that we need to talk about is it's uh, we have an election coming up in about two weeks. And I've talked about this on the podcast for the last three months. And I continue to say, and hopefully everybody believes me, this is not a political statement. But if uh, Vice President Biden wins the White House and the um, uh the Democrats flip the Senate and take control of that. They'll keep control of the House because they got about a 30, 35 seat advantage. Uh, there is a very, very good chance that capital gain taxes and tax rates are going to go up. So that's another conversation, I'm sure, uh, DeWalker, that you've been thinking about if you've got any deals in the hopper. Uh, I've got I've got one right now that they that we want to close before, you know, 31st. When do we have to do this? I said, 
1159 or earlier on December 31st works just fine for me if the money hits the bank account because I mean, they, they could, and, and the numbers that you live with, that you deal with are, could be eight figures. And that if they raise the capital gains rate in 2021, I mean, that's a huge amount of tax, right? That's correct. You know, so I mean, that that's, so, um, yeah, I mean, all the deals we have in the pipeline in, in uh, closing the next 60 days, I mean, there's a huge sense of urgency um, you know, independent of what happens uh, uh, on, on November 4th, you know, to make sure that we know what the, no, the known is today, what the tax rate is in 2020. Uh, no matter what happens in the party, we don't know the tax rate in 2021. And um, at some point, the federal government has to recover the investment they've made to sustain the economy in 2020. Yep. So I think both parties will have to make some decisions that will have some impact in the next upcoming years. Um, so yes, I mean, that is imperative for, you know, any of your audience members to think about, you know, if they are looking to have a transaction happen by December 31st, it is imperative. You, you, you have a known, if you're comfortable with the known, let's move forward with the known because the unknown could maybe the same might be more. It's yeah. not going to be less. So one of the last things we're coming to the, to the time that we've got to wrap this up and, um, so what I've read is that right now, 20 to 25% of the dental profession is, we'll call it group practice. And, and group practice could be anywhere from two practices to a thousand practices. Where do you see this going in the next, first question is, where do you see this going in the next couple of years? Um, and and is there a time, uh, I mean, I've had some people say to me, uh, DeWalker, you said 10 to 15 year window earlier in the podcast. I've had people say, you know, this window to exit as a multiple practice owner is going to end in about five years. Where do you see the market today? Where do you see it going? And 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 is there an end to this? Well, Art, um, I play the lottery every weekend. And I, I have to tell you, I haven't won yet. <laughs> well, I'm Powerball, Mega Ball, you pick it, I'm in it. You know, you got to be in it to win it, right? That's right. Um, so I think, you know, we're, uh, you know, I think the, I, mean, I think I'm not going to challenge somebody that's made a five-year statement, but I think that'd be an aggressive consolidation in the space. I, I will say, if anything COVID has done is added more fuel to consolidation, so I don't want to discount the perspective of five True. years, uh, but we do think there's a substantial amount of, of, of growth in the private practice space to kind of push back from it or even not go to corporate. So we're seeing more and more emerging groups that are emerging group, I would say two to three locations getting there and just kind of having that position to hold on to, to compete. So I do think the window, I still stand by my statement, 10 to 15 years, a good consolidation window. A consolidation window would mean that 70 to 75% of the market is uh, with, the, uh, with the bigger groups. Uh, so I think that's a little bit longer of a window than I think you know some of the other speakers might have said. Um, maybe I'll be corrected in three years or four years. Uh, but I think you know when we started this journey in 2016 and we forecasted where we thought the journey would be in 2020 to 21, I think we're pretty much in line with what your statistics are at, and we anticipated a 22 to 25 percent, um, you know, market uh, penetration from the uh, group practice space, and you know, your statistics are right in line with how we anticipated it, and we think it's another 10 year, 15 year journey. So, I wouldn't say the sky is falling. I I I, I don't <laughs> think that's happening, uh, but and I I would say if you think the sky is falling, you know, still be resolved to the right business and and really answer the question. If a bigger group uh, opened up across the street from you, and and you are facing a the, the the bigger the next Walmart across from you, you know what is your competitive advantage? What is your value proposition? And how are you going to compete against that? And I would not uh, uh, dissolve to the fact uh, uh, um, that you know they're going to run you out. I think you can still be very competitive and have a good uh, market opportunity. Last question, real quick, and then I'm going to have you give out your information one more time. What about specialists? I mean, are there a uh, consolidation and exit strategy for specialists? Yes. Um, I would say probably 40% to 50% of our client base is specialist. Um, so I think I alluded, you know, we work a lot in the pedo ortho space. We work a lot in the oral surgery um, endodontic space. So uh, probably about 50% of our clients in the, is, is that specialty. Uh, so I think there's more and more platforms for that space that are growing um, consolidating. Uh, the other 50% happens to be just a general business that's aggregating other specialties. 
you know, as far as, you know, bringing in PETA, oral surgery, endodontics, perio in the in-house. Uh, but demand for specialty platforms, uh, specialty platforms um, on a general basis tend to be more profitable. I'm not going to make that as a broad stroke uh, over GP. I've seen GP businesses being around 22% EBITDA, and I've seen pedo businesses being around 22% EBITDA. But G- usually pedo ortho is around 25% in, uh, and, you know, in bottom line profit. Uh, after normalized clinical compensation. So when you say EBITDA, you know, obviously the dentist has been paid for the normal services. Um, and so I think there's a, a real attraction from the buyer position to buy specialty services. Dr. Okay. Carr, that was great information on this podcast. One more time, would you please give out your contact information for our listeners? And it will be on the show notes also. Great. And Art, thank you so much for having us. Uh, our website is www.tusk.com hyphen partners.com. Uh, my direct contact, my email is D I W A K A R at Tusk hyphen partners.com. My cell phone is 973-722-5913. Or you can also email directly in our company, which is info at Tusk hyphen partners.com. And that actually goes to all three of the guys, Kevin, Perrin, and myself. So one of us will be sure to respond to it. And we also have a podcast that your listeners can subscribe to. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening to the podcast. If you want to get a hold of me in my office in Tustin, my number is 657-279-3243. Email me at a Wiederman. that's W-I-E-D-E-R-M-A-N, at uh, idebailey.com, that's E-I-D-E-B-A-I-L-L-Y.com. Uh, make sure if you're interested in the research and development tax credit to go on to www.idebailey.com forward slash dental RD. Well, that's it for this episode of the Art of Dental Finance and Management with Art Wiederman CPA. Thank you for listening. Please tell all your friends about the podcast and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to today's episode of the Art of Dental Finance and Management podcast. Be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you never miss an episode. The Art of Dental Finance and Management podcast is produced by Ide Bailey in partnership with Art Wiederman, CPA, Decisions in Dentistry Magazine, and the Academy of Dental CPAs. For audience questions and feedback, email Art Wiederman, awiederman at idebailey.com. That's A W I E D E R M A N at E I D E B A I L L Y dot com. Or you may call Art at 657-279-3243.